5 Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Alan Clement. Alan helps individuals, teams, and companies become great at making and selling products that people will buy. His own experience as an entrepreneur has proven effective at helping him to help others. Today we're going to be discussing his book, When Coffee and Kale Compete. Let's ask Alan five good questions. But first, I'm happy to announce my literary debut, The Rebel Allocator, is now available on Amazon in both print and digital formats. You could say it's about time. I've been pouring my heart into this book for more than three years. A well-known SoCal billionaire received an early copy of the book and actually called me to say he enjoyed the story and was adamant that I get it made into a movie. Talk about a surreal experience getting 20 minutes on the phone with one of my heroes. My friend Tobias Carlyle had this to say. Jacob Taylor has written a modern-day investment classic. The Rebel Allocator is reminiscences of a stock operator for value investors. It's a fictionalized retelling of the lessons in The Intelligent Investor in an accessible page-turner. If you want to learn how to invest like Warren Buffett by sitting at his knee, this is the book for you. Wow, how flattering is that? I was blown away when he sent me that. I've created dozens of ad-free author interviews over the last five years and never asked for anything in return. If you've gotten any value out of these efforts, please do me a personal favor and pick up a copy of The Rebel Allocator. I promise you won't regret it. And now, on with the show. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is Alan Clement, and he's the author of When Coffee and Kale Compete. Uh, thanks for being with us, Alan. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So before we jump into the actual questions, uh, I was hoping to hear the story of, of kind of how you originally came across this, this job-to-be-done uh, framework. Right. So the story for me, it came out of really my own need of figuring out, which I learned later on, but how to create sustainable growth for a product and for a business. So the story goes like this. I was a product manager for at a company. Our product was called FDT, which I think it's still around. And it's a, a tool for engineers to use when they write code. Okay. That's, that's the gist. So, and I was doing what a good product manager is supposed to do, or at least I thought, right? Which is, well, you talk to your customers and you find out what their pain points are and you know what they do and don't like and where they're dissatisfied with the product and you know all this kind of stuff. So I did that. I collected all those data. I figured out, okay, here are the places. If we make these changes, satisfaction will go way up. Um, customers will be happy, so on and so forth. So did that. Um, you know, we spent you know, 350,000 euros, six months of work, and then we released all the changes. And what happened? Well, customer satisfaction went through the roof. People were very excited about it. You know, all, all the numbers go up, right? Uh-huh. Uh, you know, tweets, uh, tickets, you know, bugs go down, uh, people being happy, thank you emails. You know, all all that, you know, if, if, if we were doing NPS, that would have gone up too. Yeah, net promoter. But there's one score. number, yeah, but there's one number that did not go well. Sales. Revenue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sales. Yeah, exactly. So, and that was like a big aha moment for me. Actually, it was, it was like when the CEO came in, he's like, hey, Al, you just spent all this money. And basically, you know, we got some sales, but it basically just paid for the investment that you did. So, Really, it was all wash, and so that's when I realized, wow, um, my job, as it were, my responsibility as a product manager is not to uh, make our customers happy, right? Uh, you know, improve satisfaction and whatever, whatever. It's to grow the product, <laughs> get more people to, to buy it, or figure out ways of selling it at a higher price. What all that kind of stuff, right? There's actually a whole bucket of things that we we get into but that's all that stuff yeah and so that's kind of where i around the same time as i was struggling with this uh, i I heard about jobs to be done which was studying what causes people to adopt a product so that's a perfect tee off for our first question which is uh explaining job to be done or customer jobs um what they mean through the example of a snickers versus a milky way Right. Okay, good. So 
it's it's I'm embarrassed to say, but it, it took us a while to figure out the the best way to explain this because we, you know we're not we're like practitioners venturing into science, not scientists. So I had like had to learn how to do this all correctly and so on and so forth. But basically, jobs to be done is it's the study of consumers adopting and abandoning products. So like, why does that happen? What causes it? All those dynamics, right? Um, so that's what jobs to be done is about. And I would say, and you know, through that investigation of what causes people to, to adopt a product or leave it, we learn other things, right? Like what do people really value? Um, you know, how, how do customers define or consumers define competition? Um, you know, how do they see markets? How do they assess the value if a product is delivering them the progress that they want, which is what we're, I mean, all this kind of stuff. We, so we learn really all this new stuff, which I think before was ignored under what I'll, I'll call it the customer needs paradigm, which mm -hmm. was more like, well, you just go out and you study their problems and then you solve those problems and then magic <laughs> revenue. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so when we kind of revisited that whole like, well, what causes people to adopt or abandon products, we discovered, wow, we need a new way of defining value. We need to figure out how people determine what's a fair price or not, all that kind of stuff. And so in, in coming what, back to your Well, what I you, found um, I found pretty amazing about this was that it, it actually rolls in so many different philosophies of different yes. uh it's very multidisciplinary from yep. champatering like creative destruction to yep. uh you know Kahneman and Tversky prospect theory to uh you know Deming and systems awareness. Yep. Like it's it's pretty amazing actually how when you how deep the, the rabbit hole goes there. <laughs> Yeah, that was, you know, again, I think that was me. Like, again, I was trying to figure out, you know, I, I was like, basically, I was trying to look for answers and I couldn't find direct, like, I had questions and I couldn't find those questions, like, people talking about those questions and, and answers to those questions. But, like, I found that, like, oh, wait a minute. And, like, economics 50 years ago somebody answered like part of that question here uh -huh. and then oh over here you know when it comes to you know determining you know value of something or you know so on and so forth well, that's kind of been answered over here with with these people so i kind of had to like piece together all that stuff because again you know a, a lot of these we'll call it traditional, you know, work and, and so on and so forth is, you know, it's like, well, there's economic theory and there's macro and micro. And then there's, you know, that's like there it's, it's that category, but no one was like, well, what does a product manager need to do to create growth for a product? What does a CEO need to know to create growth for their company? Those, you know, so that, that wasn't really, those investigations were not done with that context in mind. Right. Silos be damned. How do we do this? Yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. So maybe go through the kind of Snickers versus Milky Way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the short thing is that, you know, once upon a time, if, if you go look at older ads of Snickers, and I, I have it right now, I mean, you probably can search it online. It's actually quite hilarious. I think you just do a, a YouTube search for, like, like, the Snickers song, right? And so it's basically like this 1980, or mid to late 1980s commercial. A guy gets his, gets his guitar, and he starts – singing about Snickers, you know, chocolate covered mountain tops and caramel and whatever, right? <laughs> um, you look at that, but then you, you, you compare that with how they talked about Snickers more recently, you know, in the mid, late 90s, right? It, it's all those like commercials, like you're not you when you're hungry. Right. Right. And so basically kind of what the illustration is there, it's like, it's like once upon a time, Snickers is like thinking, okay, we're, we're, we're getting killed by by Milky Way, like we're not getting sales, we're getting killed by uh, Three Musketeers or you know, and Milky Way, so on and so forth. You know how you know, their sales are going up, ours are not. We're obviously losing to them. You know, we have to figure this out. But then an, an investigation happens. Like, well, wait a minute, let's actually investigate why people are buying and using Snickers. And then when we do that, what are they? What else are they shopping for or considering as competition to Snickers? Yeah. What's the job story, that they're trying to do with yeah, that Snickers bar? Yeah. yeah. So long story short, it's about, well, actually it's about like 
preventing being hangry, right? Yeah. Or, you know, like, you know, I want to make sure that when I'm traveling in the car for a long distance that if I get hungry, I can just whip out Snickers and eat and I don't have to pull over and get, you know, lunch or whatever it is, right? Or if I'm traveling for a business conference, you know, I don't want to be hungry 10 minutes before my presentation, so I'll eat a quick Snickers and then, you know, I'll, I can perform for the next hour. And, and in those contexts, no one was saying, oh, well, I, you know, maybe the Snickers or the Milky Way. Right? That never happened. Well, I don't want to say never, but that, that, was not, that wasn't really happening. And so that, that makes you know, this candy of our manufacturers recognize, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, even though Snickers and Milky Way, they're, they're on the you know, Pretty, shelf together, they're right yeah. next to each other, but they actually don't compete because no one says like, oh, do I get Snickers or the Milky Way? Right. right? I won't say no one, but you know, generally speaking, right, that, that's not really what's going on there. Yeah, so they, I guess they, they, they pivot like they, they try to frame the Milky Way more as like a comfort food, and yes, exactly. and, the, and the Snickers was about like satisfying your hunger because it had. Yes. And all we're talking about is the difference between like peanuts or not, basically. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah, but but that also has pretty substantial effects, right? You know, because you know we're in our day and age, the the, the food scientists can do pretty ridiculous stuff um, with food. And so, you know, that that determines like, okay, well, like, for example, the Snickers bar, it's designed that when you eat it, it's it's supposed to, um, I think the word is uh, metastasize or something like that. I don't know what the right is, but it's like it, it clumps up. It's actually designed to clump up in your mouth and to swallow in clumps huh. to mimic the feeling of eating food. So they don't want it to really dissolve in your mouth. They want to actually to kind of swallow it in chunks. That, that tells your body, yes, I'm eating food, I'm going to be satiated. Whereas for Milky Way, that's designed to like s- dissolve in your mouth and slide down. Right? So then that's a much more luxurious kind of rewarding, huh. maybe not even food experience. It's just kind of really more about like pleasure, like that kind of way. Yeah. So that even kind of like tells you how even the candy bar itself gets designed differently. So that that what I find fascinating about this is that then this job to be done dictates not only you know the product innovation of what does it do in your mouth, but it dictates the messaging and the advertising. Yeah, it's it absolutely. becomes everything really. Yeah, yeah, and and it's like, and and kind of what I want to make a little point here is that I, I think it, when people think about jobs to be done, don't think about it as like some framework, like execution framework. Because then that's so often how we think and that's kind of a rabbit hole to get into. But think of it as like it's a theory of demand. Like like how is demand created? How should you describe that demand? How does it change? How does it grow? How does it go away? And then like just think of it that way. It's a theory about how demand operates. Hmm. And and then once you phrase it that way, like, oh, yeah, then, yeah, then it does affect – marketing like how we define markets it does affect like how we communicate the value of a product it also comes into like how do you acquire more customers like when like when's the best time to stimulate demand in someone like you know that's actually a lot of our work actually is is helping organizations it's like look actually like like for example they'll say look we need to create growth but we don't really know how and then it's like so often um because i think the way it, you know, it's it's everyone always talks about innovation and whatever, whatever. So, for so many times, so many organizations, their their knee jerk reaction is, okay, we need to innovate better, or we need to change the product, or whatever it is, right? But actually, a lot of times, your product is fine the way it is. What what it is is that like you're just not communicating it correctly, or you're not like you're targeting the wrong people, or you're targeting people at the wrong time. Like like for example, um. Um, I I could talk about this because uh, this was years ago, so my little NDA stuff has expired. But like for example, when I was doing work for a CRM company, you know, we were investigating people about like when they first heard about the product, and it was interesting. You know, when they were like searching online, they were not searching for like CRM, right? Right? They actually were like, how do I hire a salesperson, right? Or like, how do I create a sales process? How do I get started with sales? And so like that's what like that's how their demand like began growing. Because like they didn't know that they needed or could benefit from a CRM. They're just like, oh, I just started a new business. 
I guess I got to do sales. How do I do sales? Like right. sales 101. It was further upstream uh, from yeah, CRM exact, as a. Right, exactly. Because because then they learn like, well, you know, oh, wait, there's this because a lot like this actually happened to me as a business owner. I didn't even know what a CRM was. Like I, but I knew like I had I needed sales. Right. But I had no idea. Why, so but then they learn, well, we should actually that's where we should be targeting people. Like you don't need a salesperson. You can just get a CRM. You know, why spend 100 grand a year on a salesperson? When, you know, for 10 grand a year, you can have a CRM and do it way better or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Like that's how you like once you understand the mechanisms of demand, like how it's created and so on and so forth, you can predict it and even affect it like you can control it. Yeah. So question number two, what what's the problem with chasing visible figures and, and how does that relate to creative destruction? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is a. um yeah, visible figures. So that is – so I, I, I kind of stole that from, from Deming. That's one of his deadly diseases, which I, I think it's great. Um, so the kind of like a, a little background on that is you know, he talks about you – know, so his, his – like what he was fighting against was um, at the time – it still is, right? Management by objective or even some people now rebrand it as management by outcome, which is basically like managers – and I'm just going to – speak bluntly who either too lazy or don't know how to manage or we'll just say things like okay you know increase churn by five percent or i'm sorry you know i'll reduce churn by five percent or increase sales by ten percent like they just like think about you know let's let's govern by numbers and then you know if if we hit the numbers and you're celebrated if you fail you get fired you know so like that's one problem of like thinking about Visible figures. The other thing is, he's, he's making the point of that. Like a lot of stuff, a lot of times we put. Unfortunately, we just think that well, if there's some number associated with something, then it's it's true. And scientific and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, you know, NPS must be scientific because it's you know using numbers and calculations and so so therefore it must be reliable. But the, but when you actually understand you know measurement theory and whatever whatever it's actually totally bogus and nonsense. But you know again it's like people just thinking that they just want to have some number and that if they have some number, then that somehow like equals truth. And and without really recognizing that well, you know there's another great great quote which is um, Sir Lord I forgot actually Deming quotes this guy I can't remember the the, the guy's name exactly but. It goes something like, um, just because you can count it, count it doesn't make it important, and just because it's important doesn't mean it can be counted. Oof. Yeah. I don't have the quite word just right, but it's basically it's like. Yeah, you get you the know. gist of it. It's yeah, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of unknowns too there that yes, are exactly. important that you can't measure. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, you know, you can't measure people bad mouthing your product I, I mean some people say well you can measure on, on social media but you know you can't measure me you know me and like my friends at some conference and like oh yeah don't buy that product you know it's, it's total garbage you can't measure that kind of stuff right you, you can't you can't measure you know and, and people do like influencers and it's maybe a little, a little easier but you can't really measure you know it, it kind of reminds me of that other expression which is uh I forgot what it was, but it was like some guy talking about marketing. He was like, half my marketing. Oh, God, what is it? Yeah. It's a, so no, it's so, what is so, it? something like uh, 50% of the money is wasted yeah. in in marketing, but I just don't know which 50%. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, there's a certain point where, you know, don't try to just operate by numbers, right? Recognize that there's really things that just can't be put into a number. Yeah, which makes sense because at the end of the day, it's it's this calculus of how much value someone is getting from a product, and it's inside yep. their head, and it's going to be. Exactly. I don't, you know, it's almost it's hard to imagine how we would get that number out of their head, right. other other than yeah. the revealed preferences of are they buying it or not, right? Well, that's exactly it. You're right. Yeah, which actually, to me, I mean, to me that that is the number that matters for for a company is like, well, are sales going up or not? You know, but but all the other 
things you need to know before that may or may not be able to be quantified or counted. Yeah. So question number three, what are the forces of progress and how they relate to job to be done? Yeah. So the I'll have to say um, we have kind of moved on from the forces of progress. Mm. We, we use it a bit, but we have evolved the model. But I'll, I'll describe the model as it was, and we figured out kind of what was – I won't say wrong. It's not really wrong, but incomplete about it. But they have the forces of progress, basically, it's, it's based um, – you can look it up. It's based upon uh, – a psychologist, his name was Kurt Lewin, who kind of had this model about like how how people or how things change, and that there's like changing like forces driving change, but other forces like preventing that change from happening. And so we, we thought about well, that helps explain why people would or would not adopt a solution. Right? There's forces that are you know basically pushing them or pulling them to make a change. Uh, but then there's also forces that are kind of getting away and, and preventing them from from doing that. So you know, at the time we thought about, okay, well we got push and pull. So push are like the outside world is like forcing you to change. You know, um, like an example is it could be just as simple as like my car broke down, or I got a new job somewhere else and I'm moving from California or LA to New York City, so I don't need my car anymore. Like for example, I, I think. Of, Things of that nature, right? Or pull is maybe more intrinsic things, right? Like I'm attracted to this or, you know, I want to become a better parent. Like no one's really pushing me to do that, but I, I just want to become a, a, a better parent. Or there's things about particular solutions that are pulling me towards it that make me attracted to it. So it's like that's it. So like push would be like putting your foot on the gas and, and, and the pull might be like the steering wheel. Like, well, actually, where, where does that energy go? Um, and then the other thing before we had like habit and anxiety as beating the restraining forces. So things like, well, yeah, I wanted, and it can be very functional. Like, oh yeah, we wanted to switch to HubSpot, but it's missing integration to this database. So we couldn't do it. So we went to Salesforce instead. It could just be like very tactical or just like, oh, it was really hard to, discipline myself on yeah. using a CRM. So I tried it, but then failed after two, two weeks. I wasn't filling out everything. Just pure, so like, pure inertia sometimes. Yeah, and... exactly. Exactly. And then another thing was like anxiety, you know, maybe it's like, well, you know, the product, it's not off. Like uh, this happens a lot. Like, well, there's no trial for the product or the return. There's no return policy. Like, like maybe like fancy shoes, like pretty much if you buy like, you know, expensive pair of shoes. A lot of times, like, like, well, if it's unworn, you can return it. It's like, well, okay, well, if I put it on and wear it for a few days and I get a it blister, feet, it's like, yeah. oh my gosh, yeah, then it's like, oh crap, I just, you know, I can't return it now. So like the anxiety of like, well, I don't want to commit because I'm worried that it may not work out. So that that, that was the original forces. However, we've moved away from that, or we've kind of like re reworked it. And so now what we do is we describe, this is what I'll talk about in, in the next book. We, we describe it now actually in terms of unmet goals, catalysts, and constraints. So basically how, how it works out is basically the unmet goals would be your, you know, your push or your, your, your pulls really. Like what yeah. am I trying to improve? How am I hoping things will be better, right? Constraints – would be, and this is kind of why why we flipped it, because it was like, well, we had habit and anxieties, but there's actually all these other reasons why I may not switch to a product. Um, you know, maybe maybe I just can't get buy-in from my wife or whatever, or all these other things that may just stop me from adopting a, a solution. So, and then we also figured out, well, it needs to be related to to the unmet goals too. So it's like, well, I'm trying to become a better parent, but what are my constraints stopping me? Well, you know, I don't. I don't know this, or I'm not really sure how to get started, or whatever it is. And so, like that kind of thing came up. Uh, then I think we kind of changed pushes into catalysts. So that's actually like, well, what's actually creating the goal, or you know, planking the goal in me, or what's introducing the constraint into me? And what's going to add the energy to the system to to yes. trigger the change? Yes, exactly, exactly. So we've it's it's similar but different. But we kind of move from the forces, which is you know okay and good, but to, to, to this new model, like, well, here's actually the, the, the parts of demand that we call it. 
you know, unmet goals, constraints, which prevent those goals from being met, and then catalysts, which either introduce a constraint or, you know, cause a goal to become unmet. Yeah. So question number four, how do systems interact with innovation? Oof. Wow. Okay. Keep that in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a tough question. A little open-ended. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want so, to see where you'd go with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here, here is how I – here is how systems thinking has helped me as a – just understanding the world, but also like for, for anything. And, and I'll, I'll give an example. So um, the old way of studying the world – Right, used to be, you know, we'll call it like during the like mechanical age. Was basically, if you want to understand something, you break into its parts, and then you study those parts. So that was that, right? But then the kind of systems way of of looking at understanding something is like, well, how does it react to other things, and, and like what affects its behavior? So, like for example, a you know, an a, a analysis way of looking at like water, for example, it's like, well, if you want to understand water, okay, well, it's made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, so break those up. Okay, now how does hydrogen act? Okay, well, how does how does oxygen act? Okay, well, what's 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 made up of oxygen? Let's break down oxygen. Oh, that's full of these many electrons, this many whatever. It's just breaking things yeah. down, analyzing things. Reductionism. Right? right, exactly. But you don't really learn anything about water. <laughs> like like knowing that Water is H2O actually doesn't help you understand how water turns into ice. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's a difference. It's like systems is like actually look – if you want to understand a thing, don't break it Don't break it down. If you want to understand a thing, like look look all around it and like see what, what it, it interacts with. And, and so that's how we – you know, like for me and think about demand and stuff, like I think about, you know, like, like for example um, – Customer needs. Like, I get this all the time. People just want to break down customer needs. Like, oh, how do you break it down, break it down, break it down? I'm like, oh, that's not really how it works if you take, like, a systems approach to it. It's like, well, you know, what environment is the consumer trying to create for themselves, right? And then, like, how, and then like describe that. And so you're not really, like, breaking it down. You're actually building up. You're, you're, you're constructing an environment that, that they want to create for themselves. So, like, like, for example, I, I the example I use is, like, if you want to describe, best describe an oak tree, like how an oak tree can grow and thrive, there's nothing really to break down. You say, well, what type of environment needs to exist? Well, it needs 100 liters of water a day to draw, and it needs this amount of sunlight, and then this amount of soil, and this amount of room to grow. So you're describing an environment that all have to work together to grow and thrive. But you can't break down 50 gallons of water or 100 liters of water. Like, how does breaking down 100, 100 liters of water help you understand how that creates the environment for the for the tree? So it's the system thinking is like, what's the environment? What are the attributes of this environment? And how do they all interact to produce this effect you want, which in the case of an oak tree is, you know, grow and, and thrive? Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, so question number five, and not to just you know, uh, disparage anybody, but, but what does Clayton Christensen have wrong in his, his model of, uh, innovation? Oh yeah. Yeah. The, the, um, so it's, it's really funny and I've, I've, you know, I don't want to get into the, the, the drama and the politics of it so much, <laughs> but it's, it's been interesting because I, I asked their team about this, uh, Clay's people and they just were kind of wishy-washy about it for whatever reason. I'll leave it at that. But it's really funny. Clay promotes – he wrote a book about jobs to be done, but jobs to be done invalidates his disruption theory. And that just seems to not – either they don't – and it's really funny. He even talks about it. I think he has this course online, like, like actually like an online HBR class, like on disruptive innovation. Yeah. And like one part is jobs to be done, and I'm like – How did you square those like, two? Yeah, because you... like for example – if you go back and look at his work on disruption theory, um, you know, more or less it was like, well, organ, you know, companies go out of business because they're listening to their customers to continually improve the product. And by doing that, they, they miss out like for a, a cheaper, less expensive version of the product, which will, you know, over time, you know, eclipse the more heavier clunker version of, of the technology. But the problem with that 
I mean, there's yep. actually a lot of, and, and, and people have pointed out, but there's actually lots of inconsistencies. Like, for example, all of his predictions, every single prediction he made was wrong. Like, you know, like he said that Seagate, for example, would be on its way to being bankrupt. And 20 years later, it's still the number one manufacturer of hard drives. Um, he said the iPhone would fail and that Nokia would win, which the exact opposite happened. Nokia now is gone, and the iPhone is a mis- best-time product. He said he said the iPod would fail because it's all you know whatever. Like basically, and I, that's why I think he stopped making predictions because they all were wrong. But, Probably smart, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't make but predictions. The, the reason is that, and kind of how great jobs to be done is that all his research and conclusions were based upon product categories. He never looked like he never thought that. Oh, wait a minute! An iPhone is not like doesn't compete with mobile phones. As it competes with like laptop or like watching TV or you know, whatever, right? It's just like all these other you know parents. I do it. You know, I if I want my kid to sit still on a long car ride, here, look at this phone. You know, so maybe that that competes with some other distraction device, right? Or like one of those like laptop DVD players or something. Right, and it like, does so many jobs. That yeah. used to be done by individual things. That it, yes. um, you know, it's it's kind of no, it's no wonder that it's so successful. Then, right, exactly. It's and it's like, for example, you know, the what put I, I don't know if, if you'd argue this, but it's like what put, you know, what made like like you know like for him, I think he even uses example. It's like, you know, the like Radio Shack was disruptive to this or whatever, you know, so on and so forth. But really, like. What really put out like corner stores and that kind of stuff is like Amazon Prime, like things just showing up at your home. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not which I guess maybe you argue like, well, that kind of is like a cheaper store, but it's just like eliminating the store. Like there is no store. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's just like, well, yeah, I just go online, I click a button, and there you go. So it's like that's that's what kind of yeah, you know, it's it's that's really what the disruption is. It's not a cheaper, a cheaper technology within the same product category. It's actually when your whole entire product category becomes irrelevant because some other technology was made, which is, which again comes back to consumer behavior. Consumers don't engage in that behavior anymore. Like that's what actually is disruptive. So maybe a good analogy would be <clears throat> if you are running Greyhound buses and yeah. like Clayton's, uh, his version would be like some cheaper bus comes along and now like you can't compete because you're this stodgy old bus company. But really the thing that came along and killed you was, was Southwest and someone being able to take a a flight for much cheaper and faster than, but it wasn't, it's not, it wasn't even in your category. Like you couldn't see that coming really. Right. You know, exactly. Yeah. That, that's, I I might even kind of go further even you could argue, but yeah. And in that case, actually people, might be willing to spend more than a Greyhound ticket. Like, well, I can take a Greyhound ticket, you know, on a bus to whatever, from Pittsburgh, I don't know, whatever, Atlanta to, to, to New York City, and it takes 12 hours, you know. A cheaper version of a bus doesn't do that. Actually, oh, oh no, uh, instead of paying $50 for a, a, a bus ticket, I'll spend $75 for a plane ticket that takes two hours. Like, that... That's, that's worth not, it, yeah. Not, yeah, you know, that's not accounted for. Or even, but you can even be more dramatic, which which happens like in the book, for example, like what, like for conferences, right, you know, some of the biggest competition for attending a conference is actually like webinars. It's not like a cheaper version of a conference or something. It's actually like some of these like webinars that people can see for free. So maybe, or maybe you, go ahead. Maybe talk about that a little bit about, um, how you determine pricing based on oh, yeah. the job to be done and, and really like yeah. filling the the customer's need. Use, but yeah. it has, having very little to do with potentially the cost that it takes to produce it, yeah. it's not really about that. So this is something that we're doing now. And, and we're actually, I'll, I'll be specific. We're, we're getting into this now because now that we we are recognizing, we encourage organizations and people to think about value-based pricing. Right. What is actually the value being being delivered, and how do customers compute that value? That's what you need to figure out. What's actually the the brain process going on? It's not, you know, like for example, here's an example: is like we were we we're talking with someone, and like a lot of CRM companies, software products, like well, we do our pricing based upon how many seats that you buy, 
right? And it's like, well, why? Like, well, that's what Salesforce does. Or, you know, they're just kind of looking at each other like, well, how does CISO, you know, we'll just, that's how we determine pricing is, okay, well, we'll be in between Salesforce and this product. And right. that's how we'll be. will be $9. Yeah, whatever it is, right? Um, as opposed to thinking about, well, you know, what is actually what are you competing against for one, but also like we think about like progress based pricing, like value based pricing too. Like, well, maybe the, the best way to price your CRM is not by how many seats, but maybe how many concurrent deals that you're operating at once or like um, you know, how many leads do you handle at, at, at a time. So it's actually because because now that you understand the progress is like, well, I'm trying to get control of my sales process. Or I'm trying to scale my sales process. Like those are like the jobs. And so you price for those jobs. Like, okay, well, if you're trying to scale to this, you can scale to here for this amount, and you can scale up to this amount. Like, pricing based upon that, as opposed to just how many seats you have. Um, but yeah, but again, like, that's one way to think about pricing. But another inter interesting thing is, again, once you know the competition, you can price things more appropriately. Like, well, I could hire a CRM or spend $100,000 on this salesperson. So you know that i'm not saying that's the only factor but you have to like think about like how are they constructing competition in their mind and a lot of times and again like with crm a lot of times you're competing with a free tool like an excel spreadsheet right so or, like or a piece of paper and a pencil or right so yeah you're you're somewhere between free and like hundred thousand dollars a year but like that just shows you the kind of you have to think about it very differently um and i think those two things I mentioned before are helpful. Like think about what is competition in their mind and, and kind of how they are determined price based upon what they see as competition or options. And two, think about like value based pricing depending upon the progress that the personal organization is hoping to make. You know, cause you know, if, if, if your product is like, well, we help organizations go from, you know, we're enterprise product and we help you save a hundred million dollars a year on manufacturing defects. Well, They'll pay ten million dollars a year for that, because right. that's you know what I mean. Like you, you think of it that way, right? Rather than looking at every other company of like, well, what do other people t t tend to charge for, uh, yep. you know, this for a seat? Yes, exactly. Yep. So, bonus question: We always ask everybody, and this is for a book recommendation. And typically, okay. it's something that's kind of maybe under the radar, or maybe at least you think is underappreciated. Yeah. Great. So I'll just choose where I was on my desk right now because I was uh, having a debate with someone about something. Um, so I have ACOF's best. Mm. So he's a, um, he's a systems guy yep. If uh, for people who are not familiar with him. Yep, yep. So really great stuff. He has really, you know, super smart guy. Um, he passed away recently, but he, you know, he, he's in there with Deming, you know, they were buds, but it's, it's helpful. This is geared towards people interested in like management, but it's truly really for anyone, but he, he's kind of like laying down like a foundation of like, well, here's actually how you should think. And then now we'll get into like, like management, but he introduced some of his really cool things like something that has affected me, like, like idealized design um, and, and like things of that nature. He also talks about, um, I think, uh, interactive planning he calls it hmm. um so you know because he like new ways of planning and new ways of organizing new ways of making change and i uh, and it's i still find it original and relevant even even though you know this is stuff he wrote over the last 50 years which i think even kind of shows it's that lindy effect it's like mm -hmm. it's been around for this book is the content he wrote 50 years ago is still relevant to today which means that it's probably going to be continue to be relevant for 50 another 50 years from now yeah 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 so I, I think that that's one. It's easy to read, fun. The guy's super smart. Lots of interesting stuff in there. You, um, you can jump around. That would be my ACOF's best. Wow, that's a good one. That's uh, that is off the beaten path. That's what I'm. Yes. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, Alan, thanks for coming on the show today and uh, sharing everything about uh, your book and jobs to be done. And um, really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks. Before you go, do me the huge honor of picking up your copy of The Rebel Allocator, available on Amazon in both print and digital formats. It's a business person's guide to effective capital allocation, told in a coming-of-age story of a college grad who crosses paths with a wealthy Midwesterner. It's fiction for the nonfiction reader.
Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you'd like to support this author and purchase their book, click here. If you'd like to become a subscriber to 5GQ, click here. And I included a couple other interviews that you might appreciate right here. Thanks. Happy reading.